Anyone who opts for organic food wants to lead a healthier life. But can bio be better, with conventional farming taking place all around it? It's a bit like with a smoker and a non-smoker. One person lights up while someone else is still eating, and they suffer. The organic foods business is lucrative, and fraudulent labeling is not uncommon. There's a lot of sense in having a test procedure to show that an egg really is a bioproduct. So wouldn't it be better to have only bioproduce? Gluten-free food doesn't exist. It's merely a question of the dosage. But the situation has to change. We have to act before we, we have a disaster. In Germany, fennel is harvested in autumn. Stefan Palmer has been growing it for many years, for baby tea. But the organic farmer has a problem. The wind blows pesticides used in conventional farming onto his fields. Strict limits apply to baby food. In fact, the EU plans to introduce these stringent limits for all organic foods. It would mean biofarmers like Stefan Palmer could no longer sell their produce as organic. Where the use of environmental toxins and pesticides is concerned, we totally approve of being told by Brussels, for instance, that we need to meet lower limits. We would like to do that, but it's not our fault if our land is contaminated by all these chemicals. With such limits in place, we would be held responsible. That really could put an end to eco-farming. A baby food manufacturer found residues of a certain pesticide in fennel from Stefan Palmer. Conventional farmers spray it in autumn, as soon as they have sown their winter seed. In doing so, they contaminate fields a long distance away. The active agent, it seems, can be carried by the wind for weeks. Now, Stefan Palmer harvests his fennel earlier than he used to. For a year now, we've gone to the trouble of threshing our fennel before it has reached maturity. That's why we have to spread it quickly and dry it in this moist state as fast as we can. The fennel gets warm within two hours. In the past, we used to let it dry normally, like grain, and tip it into our normal drying plant. The disadvantage of that process, however, is that it would take another three or four weeks, and in that time the herbicide in the air would accumulate more and more in the fennel and make it unmarketable. The chemical which wafts across the fields in autumn is called pendimethylin, and it can travel for many kilometers. Stefan Palmer's farm lies in the middle of a huge organic farming community where no one, as has been proved, uses the herbicide. Rudolf Vögel from Brandenburg's Office for Health and the Environment is aware of the problem. Using cabbage leaf samples, he wants to find out how long the agent can be detected in the environment. It's a phenomenon that didn't really attract too much attention in the past. It was probably underestimated. In recent years, however, we've received numerous indications, countless new test results that call for an urgent reassessment of the way certain agents are permitted. Throughout the winter, Vogel examines cabbage leaves for pendimethylin content. We know very little about the ecological impact. However, the fact is that we still keep finding the agent in crop samples. So naturally, it can cause serious problems with regard to the high quality standards. In other words, the dietary stipulations that organic produce has to meet. Pesticides used in conventional farming spread and become a problem for the entire organic sector. If the EU introduces stricter limits for residues, this will prevent many products from being sold as organic and at higher prices, even though they have been farmed organically. This is why Stefan is calling for a general ban on certain pesticides. Four weeks ago, we harvested part of our crop prematurely. The rest has been left standing, so we'll have to see what the pesticide values look like.
This is our problem. We'll have to see how these agents can be kept out of the environment and prevented from accumulating because sales of pesticides are rising considerably year by year. Environmental engineer Frieda Hofmann is a specialist in air analysis. By examining residues in the bark of trees, he can reconstruct the path taken by herbicides. He has been commissioned by the state of Brandenburg to carry out a study. For cost reasons, the German government stopped the nationwide monitoring of volatilized pesticides back in 2003. We now have no idea of the aerial distribution of herbicides and pesticides on a national level. We have, however, provided fairly clear answers on a regional basis. We have shown that the spread of the herbicide pendimethalin is not restricted to the immediate area, to a few hundred meters, but occurs on a 10-kilometer scale. This also confirms published reports on the issue. The question is, can organic food still be produced anywhere in Germany? Hoffmann has found 11 pesticides in the bark, two of them in alarming concentrations. Not only pendimethalin as expected, but also a weed killer called prosulfcarb. Conventional pesticides pose a real problem for biofarmers. Some rethinking has to be done, even if it means some people suffering a bit financially. But somehow, we just have to face reality. Each year, conventional farmers spread around 9 kilograms of pesticides per hectare. These weed and fungus killers make life easier for them. Without these chemical agents, the argument goes, the world's population could not be fed. The pesticide industry has a turnover of billions, but at the expense of the general public. The chemicals are not only found in food. When it rains, they seep into the soil and end up in the groundwater. Here, soil samples are being taken to a depth of 15 meters. In the past, water companies focused primarily on nitrates occurring as a result of over-fertilization. Nitrates are already a major problem, and we now know that pesticides could also become one. We're keeping a close watch on this. We take regular samples to see whether levels are increasing from year to year. The main problem is that many pesticides do not decompose. Once sprayed, they remain in the environment for years. This is legalized environmental pollution on a grand scale, and it also threatens our drinking water. Filtering out pesticides is extremely time-consuming and costly, and this purification is paid for by everyone who uses water. We do not assume that farmers are at fault when these agents appear in the groundwater. Farmers must be able to have confidence that highly effective active agents purchased at considerable expense will have the required protecting effect in the topsoil, but then break down and no longer appear in the groundwater. As water suppliers, we expect the chemical industry of the 21st century to manufacture active agents that have an excellent effect and are affordable but no longer appear in groundwater because they've already decomposed. Like everywhere else in Germany, here at the weekly market in Münster, organic produce is in the minority. Only 9% of Germany's farmers grow bio-produce. Their produce costs up to 30% more than the produce from conventional competitors. The price difference can be a temptation to engage in fraudulent labeling. We have already heard of conventional farmers selling their eggs as organic produce. Customers have come to us and complained that the eggs lack the appropriate stamp. So go back and exchange them, we say. We reported that incident and it caused a real stir. Cases like that make me really angry because I always think that at some point people might stop 
believing us. In 2015, the sales of organic foods in Germany rose by 11%, by 1.3% in Austria and by 5.2% in Switzerland. Is organic healthier? I think it is, but I don't know. In my experience, it is. I've been buying bio for over 20 years, so I believe in it. Sometimes I also buy conventional products because you can't always get hold of bio produce. But I notice the difference at once. It's not for me. It costs more and in the end is no different. Conventional farmers like the Holkenbrinks from the Munster region doubt whether organic is always better. I too would be delighted to know that one sort was particularly good and would enable me to lead a healthy life and live to a ripe old age. My 25 years of professional experience tells me that both are good. The local farmer as a guarantor of quality. Many people regard locally grown produce and trust as more important than an organic label. Also, because buyers cannot recognize the supposed benefits of organic farming on the actual product. Frick, Switzerland. For more than 40 years now, scientists here at the Research Institute for Organic Farming have been analyzing the differences between ecological and conventional farming. Today, they advise the European Union. They also make recommendations regarding optimum organic farming. They were the first to prove that organically grown apples contain more antioxidants than conventional apples. Antioxidants boost our immune system. But the Institute's director, Urs Nigli, warns against equating organic produce with a healthy diet. From a scientific point of view, our diet is extremely important. A healthy diet contains a high proportion of fruits and vegetables, a smaller proportion of meat, and few fat and products that are rich in sugar. Naturally, if we eat lots of fruit and vegetables, the primary advantage of organic produce is that there are no pesticide residues, and the proportion of antioxidants is higher. Urs Nigli is not only interested in possible differences between individual products, he sees the big advantage of the overall concept behind organic farming to be sustainability. Organic farming is the type of agriculture we will have in a hundred years' time. Organic farming has made tremendous progress. Nature is a cornucopia of possible solutions we can also apply in agro-ecosystems. In research, we also experiment with this cornucopia with which nature tackles problems. We try to develop solutions in such a way that farmers can use them. In order for sustainability to succeed, persuasion is called for. In Vienna, the Institute's Austrian branch is working on winning over even more consumers to bio products. Especially where meat and sausages are concerned, consumers are still reluctant to purchase bio products because prices are much higher. Reinhard Gethel has invited consumers to one of his special organic excursions in an industrial area and dispels the illusion that organic means the same as rural. Times have changed. In the past, people were closely linked to farming. Everyone had someone in the family who ran a farm and they could experience there how food was produced. Today, especially in cities like Vienna, where we are now, people have no idea whatsoever about food production. In Austria, black pudding is a popular speciality. Whether it has to be organic is a different matter. The organic product is free of glutamate and contains other spices. Organic farming is extremely cost-intensive. Meat and blood come from organic pigs which had more space to move around in, were fed fewer antibiotics or none at all, 
and were slaughtered under less stressful conditions. Organic black pudding is prepared differently from conventional varieties. Reinhard Gessel uses the excursion into the meat processing section to explain and dispel prejudices. Organic production is a tough business and farmers are under great economic pressure. Conventional farmers focus on big profits, while organic farmers work in harmony with nature. So why can't the two systems benefit from each other? Carlo Leifert from Germany heads an experimental farm run by Newcastle University in Britain. He is looking for possible overlaps between conventional and ecological farming. But it's a complex field, and surprising results are not uncommon. Combining organic fertilizer with pesticides from conventional farming, for example, even increases the residue of the weed killers in field crops. We can determine the interactions between mineral fertilizers and pesticides. If you change to totally organic fertilizers, but without abandoning pesticides, a few interesting facts come to light. For instance, when an organic fertilizer is used, the pesticide content of the produce increases. So in order to enjoy all the benefits of a switch to organic farming, the changeover has to be comprehensive. In 2009, the organic farming sector was shocked by a report from Britain's Food Standards Agency. It found no relevant difference between organic and conventional products. Leifert doubted this and reacted with a counter-study. What my studies revealed has to be proven to others, so the entire meta-analysis had to be done all over again. It took some of my colleagues, not me personally, two years, and they worked continuously on it for more than eight hours a day. Leifert's team evaluated studies from all over the world. They found that organic fruit, vegetables and cereals contain more antioxidants, which boost the body's immune system and far fewer pesticides. Conventional foods are more often contaminated with heavy metals. Leifert saw his findings confirmed. As a consumer, I started buying organic produce because of my concern about pesticides. As an agronomist, I have never found a pesticide which was introduced at some time or other and did not arouse any health concerns ten years later. That was always one of the reasons why I spend more money on organic produce. It simply contains fewer pesticide residues. Early in 2016, Leifert published a second study it confirms the differences in quality between conventional and organic meat and dairy produce. The eco products contain around 50% more omega-3 fatty acids. It depends mainly on what animals are fed. Organic standards stipulate that cattle, pigs and so on must have a certain quantity of raw fodder in their diet. And for ruminants, that is very high. To put it simply, we know that a cow produces better milk when it is fed grass than when it is fed grain. This has been apparent for a long time. The Swiss will tell you that if dairy cattle are not allowed to graze, but instead are given concentrated feed, their milk cannot be used for a hard cheese like typical Emmental. And the same thing holds true for omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are said to provide a protection against arteriosclerosis. So, organic meat is healthier than meat which is produced conventionally. It is all the more important, therefore, for consumers to be certain that a product labelled organic actually is organic especially where meat products are concerned. The well-being of the animals is an important reason for consumers to buy organic produce. But you can't tell just by looking at an egg whether or not the hen that laid it was happy. Checks carried out by Jochen Neuendorf and Volker Elsenhans are geared to ensuring that organic farmers adhere to bio-guidelines. 
We do an audit and check out all the documentation. Such controls will be needed long after I've retired, simply because it's not only about the end product. We monitor the entire process to make sure that everything takes place as stipulated in the regulations. The Frankenhausen facility near Kassel is run according to organic guidelines. Volker Elsenhans begins his inspection in the open-air enclosure for 700 laying hens. It's nice to see all the hens looking sprightly. That's one reason why eco-inspections are fun. He's satisfied with the amount of space and the vegetation in the outside enclosure. In the shed, Elsenhans relies on his experience and his senses. It smells fine. Your nose tells you, of course, where you are, but it is definitely a good smell. Can you pick one up so I can take a look at it? Anyone will do. Not even Volker Elsenhans can tell if a hen is happy, but he can judge whether farming conditions are causing the animals any suffering. It's a bit dirty, of course, but I notice that when I press here, the hen doesn't flinch. If it hurt, she'd be really annoyed. That's always a sign that the litter is loose, and not just today. So the hens aren't walking in mush, and that's important. Every organic farm has to be checked out at least once a year by an eco-monitoring centre. The inspectors often turn up unannounced. Is the amount of fodder adequate for the number of hens? Did any diseases occur? If so, were antibiotics dispensed? Jochen Neuendorf compares receipts, documentation and guidelines. If everything tallies, he's happy. If people only focus on the end product without realizing the social benefits of organic farming, climate protection, groundwater protection, nature protection and animal welfare, there will of course be a problem. On dry and windy midsummer days, fields in Schleswig-Holstein are a hive of activity. Martin Natmesnik is harvesting his organic wheat. He manages the Ritzerau estate in Schleswig-Holstein. It was purchased 17 years ago by entrepreneur Gunther Fielmann and converted to biodynamic agriculture. Driving over the field and knowing that something healthy is growing in it becomes more and more of a joy. Far better than holding a spray gun full of fungicide or pesticide and knowing that you're breathing in air that is unhealthy. Yields on organic fields are around 20% less than in conventional farming. But can this difference be offset in other ways? For his doctoral thesis, Lars Bianat is comparing the greenhouse gases from organic and conventional farming. The conventional farmer introduces nitrogen into the system in the form of mineral fertilizers. Especially after such fertilizing, high emissions of nitrous oxide can be recorded. In organic farming, where mineral fertilizers are banned, things are slightly different. There, peaks are not so pronounced or are totally absent. A benefit of organic farming, nitrous oxide, is a greenhouse gas and about 300 times more harmful to the climate than carbon dioxide. It is also because of such aspects that the sector would one day like to have a system which would provide absolute proof that a foodstuff really is organic or not. It would be great to have such a method, because customers in our farm store do ask questions. They would love to have proof that our produce is bio. A test which would prove that bread was baked with organic wheat? A possibility or just an illusion? Not for a laboratory in Jülich. 
Marcus Bonner searches for traces which the two types of farming leave in animal fodder, vegetables and grain. One crucial difference is the use of fertiliser. Organic farming opts for organic plant remains and manure, conventional farming for mineral fertiliser. Mineral fertilizer consists of nitrogen, which plants need. But mineral fertilizer has a totally different isotope signature from biofertilizer, for instance. We can determine this with our measuring techniques and thus ascertain the origin, organic or conventional farming. Ultimately, this bioproduct also goes into fodder. So an egg from a hen that has been echo-reared and given bio-fodder must also reveal this nitrogen isotope. As long as the nitrogen isotopes have not been broken down, Marcus Boner is able to determine their origin. Some products, like milk, pose a problem. A cow is nothing other than a large bioreactor. In other words, we can no longer detect mineral fertilizer because the animal repeatedly changes these isotopes. But with many other foodstuffs, his method allows Marcus Boner to determine what was used to fertilize livestock fodder or fruit and vegetables. On its own, though, the choice of fertilizer says nothing about food quality. You can argue at length about quality, but you must always remember that a bioproduct is a sustainable product. In other words, we no longer overexploit nature. On the contrary, the soils our products grow in will still be of use for the next 50 years. Seen in this light, a bioproduct is most certainly a better product. The bio-experimental farm belonging to Kiel University is on the Baltic, near Eckerförde. The Lindhof is run like any ordinary farm. It has to cover all its costs through the sale of its produce. Sabine Muse is the farm's manager. Along with 80 dairy cattle and seven sows, she also keeps 100 hens in free-range husbandry. Animals kept ecologically can only be fed biofodder comprised entirely of bioconstituents. Furthermore, they must always have outdoor access. The lighting programs used in some conventional laying systems are inadmissible. They are designed to enhance performance and give the birds the impression that it is summer all the time and that it never gets dark. Each hen must have an outdoor area of four square meters and 18 centimeters of perch space at its disposal. Sabina Moose sells her eggs for 40 cents each. Eggs from conventional production cost only half as much. Our hens lay less, not a lot less, but that's fine because the price per egg is a lot higher. And it is certainly acceptable when you can market directly and keep all the profit. Moreover, if you optimize your operations so that you don't work so much, as in conventional farming too, it is most definitely a worthwhile business. But the good price for bio-eggs is also an inducement to cheat. I think it would be sensible to have a testing procedure for eggs, something to prove that an egg has been produced ecologically. Consumers in retail outlets could then be given verification and know why they are paying more. But could appropriate farming methods and fodder really be proved? Wageningen in the Netherlands is home to one of Europe's leading research facilities for food safety. In the laboratories of the Rikilt Institute, food chemist Saskia van Root is working on methods of distinguishing organic foods from those produced conventionally. Her aim is to make fraudulent labeling impossible. There are some people who may sell conventional products for organic products and to protect the farmers, those that are involved in this organic business, we have to make sure that there are fair practices and consumers are getting what they are paying for. So that's why we need methods that can authenticate whether a product is organic or not. 
Saskia van Root places her faith in statistics. She has analysed the average composition of the yolk of an organic egg and amassed a vast amount of data. Her theory is that everything which influences an egg is noticeable in the yolk in the form of an analytical fingerprint. The analytical fingerprint of an egg, when we try to separate the organic eggs from the conventional eggs, is based on uh, the analysis of the yellow pigments. And because we are looking at different uh, yellow pigments, we call that an analytical fingerprint. And together with statistics, with calculation methods, we try to discriminate between the group of the organic eggs and the conventional eggs, because this pattern, this fingerprint, differs. But for other products, that may be other characteristics. Van Root's team collect data to determine a product's fingerprint. When chocolate melts in our mouth, additives are released which give an initial indication of whether it contains conventional or organic cocoa. Outside the EU, the definition of organic may be different, so also how an organic product uh, looks like. There's a lot of similarity. It's also difficult to find, for instance, one mark or one compound or one aspect in which they differ. So often you need multiple markers, and if you compare those simultaneously, you also need statistics. So that makes it uh, fairly complex. No matter how great the differences between bio and conventional farming methods might be, in the produce itself, they are very small and not always to the advantage of the consumer. The obligation to give laying hens nothing but organic fodder means that many bio egg producers have to buy in fodder. Yet only when food controls are carried out does it become apparent that a supplier has cheated. Freck Feldhusen heads the state's office for food safety in Mecklenburg Vorpommern. Even if there has been no fodder scandal, his inspectors nearly always find eggs containing substances which should not enter our diet. Combustion processes result in dioxins being released into the atmosphere. When it rains, these airborne chemicals are deposited on the Earth's surface. Depending on the location, dioxins can occur in certain quantities and be consumed, for instance, by hands and thus passed on to their eggs. Dioxins are soluble in fat, so primarily they are present in the fatty components, mainly in the yolk. The quantities detected in controls are nearly always below the consumer protection limits set by the EU. Nevertheless, the animal welfare concept pursued by the bio sector often leads to a loss of quality in eggs in the form of increased dioxin. Here in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, we have discovered a slight difference between conventional and biofarmed eggs. The dioxin content of bio eggs is about 30% higher. However, it is not quite clear why. We suspect it is because the hens, which has intended, spent more time outdoors, stand a greater chance of ingesting food from contaminated soil. This contamination is then passed on to their eggs. That's one possible explanation. Happy cattle on lush meadows. Ireland seems to be a paradise for livestock owners, especially conventional farmers. Along with Romania and the Netherlands, Ireland is the EU nation with the smallest area of bio pastures. Bill O'Keefe, too, is an advocate of conventional farming. People are very worried about and want to have the best quality food going into that. So we think we can create a bit of a niche here in Ireland, uh, our clean green image and, and the clean green reality really. You know, it's not just an image, it, it is reality. We're out here in March, we're grazing grass, we're producing high quality milk and we think there's a, there's a huge um, benefit to people if they consume those products and hopefully we can capitalise on that here in Ireland. You know. The advantage is that the cows eat grass, which is important for milk quality. They are outside for more than 300 days a year. To ensure that enough fodder grows, Bill O'Keefe has to spread chemical fertilizer on his fields in spring and in autumn. Despite that, 
Here, conventional is not synonymous with factory farming. On average, conventional Irish milk contains more omega-3 fatty acids and antioxidants than organic milk in Germany. The reason is the fodder. Organic farms in Germany are allowed to add concentrated feed and silage to enhance milk production, with a detrimental effect on milk quality. In other countries, however, like Austria, fixed standards already exist for hay, milk and meadow grazed milk. They stipulate how much hay a cow's overall fodder is allowed to contain, an ideal situation organic production cannot compete with. It is a good job. It's not really work, it's something that, it's, I suppose if you enjoy your work, you'll never work a day in your life maybe, but I enjoy doing it. Uh, we do have to put in long hours at times. Uh, it is manual work, but it is enjoyable work, and when everything is going well and the weather is good, it's a very good job, yeah. The calving season on Bill O'Keefe's farm is from mid-January to late February. 240 cows carve at the same time. They then return to the field and milk production. If his vet advises it, just like his father before him, O'Keefe gives all his calves antibiotics. We're happy with our system of farming. If it really stacks up from the business to organics, we might. It doesn't stack up for this farm at the moment, so we're, we have no reason to go. Um, we don't feel obliged to farm any differently, and we've, we feel our system of farming is good enough for the environment as it is. Bill O'Keefe plans to increase the size of his herd. His milk is in demand and the quality is good, without an organic seal. Apples are usually grown as monocultures. Fungi and insects are a real problem for fruit farmers. Where pesticide contamination is concerned, the apple scores badly. Copper, a toxic heavy metal which stays in the soil forever, is the controversial remedy of the organic sector. Conventional farmers also use it. In addition, they turn to various other pesticides. In line with the motto, the more the better. In tandem with 11 Swedish universities, the Svetox Institute near Stockholm is researching the risks from pesticides and other chemical compounds. The findings are alarming. More and more substances are being identified as affecting our hormone system. Many of these endocrine disruptors, as they are known, come from agriculture. Institute director Acker Bergman has been warning of these substances ever since 2012. EU has delayed the decisions very, very much, and we are in great need of, of having a number of chemicals regulated uh, in relation to, to endocrine disrupting properties. And of course, we need to, to look into those many. I just mentioned 1,000. Uh, 38 chemicals that are potentially EDCs and take decisions on them. So uh, it, it's really important that uh, this gets in place and policymakers have a, a very important job to do. Initially, Arke Bergman's research team focused on plastic bottles, foodstuffs and textile dyes. But today they know that chemical active agents which affect our hormone system are found not only in products but also in the air we breathe and controlling them is a problem. Only in dust we have measured uh, around 500 different chemicals. And of course there, there is a, a, a possibility that, that some of these fits in, into a receptor or interacting in the hormone in, in some way. And this is where, where we see an avalanche, I would say, of data on other chemicals and on other endpoints. Endocrine disruptors are suspected of being responsible for a whole range of disorders, including obesity, infertility, and even cancer and Parkinson's disease. The circulatory system transports them to every organ in the body. The pituitary gland that produces hormones for metabolism, growth, and the formation of semen or egg cells. Endocrine disruptors affect not only the gland, but also the hormones themselves. Researchers believe that the chemical substances inhibit the flow of information in the brain, that they block the synapses and also kill individual information receivers in the nerve cells. Both disorders are symptoms of Alzheimer's disease.
is actually chemicals that can interfere with the hormone system in such a way that you, you get uh, unwanted or negative effects. Uh, and of course, th this has to be on, on whole animals or humans or wildlife. So the experimental work is tremendously important in order to build a chain of do we see an effect in the lab? Do we see similar things in wildlife? And can we see associations in humans between a disease and the exposure. Scientists are called upon to act. Professor Hartmut Tauber from the Institute of Organic Farming in Kiel is looking for ways to bring organic and conventional farming closer together. His studies have found approval throughout Europe. In his view, the inconsiderate use of pesticides is out of kilter with the times. We're talking about relics of the past. We engaged in agricultural research and risk research back in 1975 and 1980, but we simply had no idea of the dangers that lurk. This means that, where pesticides are concerned, today's generation of scientists and politicians must stringently apply the principle of preventive action. To ensure that enough healthy foodstuffs can be produced in an eco-conscious and sustainable way. Then, in the final analysis, it will be the customer who decides. Conventional farming does not result in poor quality. It has been seen that animal welfare aspects also play a role as indirect quality characteristics for the consumer too and recommendations regarding animal welfare requirements in the conventional sector, which are now also coming from various supermarket chains, are moving ever closer to the standards that already exist in organic farming. We must always focus on how optimum quality can be achieved in both systems.